and God says, it's it's time for you to stop believing in me, and it's actually time for you to start following me. And I, I remember being, if not the smartest, one of the smartest guys in every single room I walked in when it came to real estate and investing. But I made zero money. So I went from almost zero to $8 million worth of real estate in one year. Just just, just doing that. Never short stopping, now I'm winning like I'm Jada. Steady through the rigor. Yeah, I'm getting bigger. Just fighting in them trenches, now I'm making seven figures like. So my guest today is one half of the Quack Brothers. And uh, I received an interesting email. And his, here's how the email read. It re reads like this. I wanted to reach out to see if Matt would be interested in collaborating with the Quack Brothers in a video for the YouTube channel. Yes. She says, yeah, we have 144,000 YouTube subscribers on our channel and we think an audience could benefit a lot from what Matt has to say. She sends a link and I realized they're right here in the Chicago land area. I was so excited. On top of that, they're also Asian, just like me. Just like <laughs> me, baby, yeah. And more importantly, I found out not only the Asian, but they're entrepreneurs mm. and more than the entrepreneurs, but they're also faith Base. So, Daniel, yeah. man, I appreciate hey. you having me at your studios. Yes, sir. And this is pretty cool here, man. Yes. Let's, let's hop in with this, man. It's pretty, it's pretty high tech. This is the highest yes. tech office I've ever been into to, to come into a studio like this and see both brands up, man. Yeah. So, awesome, man. So, I love it. Real quick, your, your background Korean. Yes. yes. Uh, how old were you when you guys came over here to? Uh, five. Yeah, I was five years old. Man. Any memories there from, from Korea? Oh, yeah, a lot. You really? Know, a lot. I, mean, I, I go back, but just amazing how far the country's come, you know, ever since it was war torn. And then, you know, it's been 50, 60 years since the war, yeah. you know, and then phew, it's one of the most technologically advanced companies. I mean, they had toilets that talk to you. I got shot. I got shot at by wait, a wait, toilet. Wait, what, what does it say? <laughs> they say, like, are you, you know, like, are you finished? Do you need to be cleaned? Got it. You know, it doesn't react. He just yeah. gives you instructions. Yeah. I remember I got shot at at, at like 2 a.m. in the morning. Cause I was like so sleepy, I just pressed whatever button. I thought it was a flush one, and it like it raised a little spout thing, and it just shot in my face. It's, it comes with a bidet. Yeah, every toilet has a bidet. Really it's incredible. Yeah, I thought it was a you know back in my Marine Corps days, Marines would call that a water fountain. Yes. <laughs> yeah, I don't like it. I just I feel violated. You know, <laughs> I would too. Yeah. I would especially at two o'clock in the morning. Like, what was that? Where did it come from? So um, when, when you guys came over here yes, from sir. Korea, what was the motivation for your family to immigrate from Korea? Yeah. Yeah, my, so my dad's a preacher, and uh, initially God had called him to start a church, you know, continue a church in Chicagoland area. And so it was interesting, man. So we, we got here when, when I was five years old. We were dirt poor. Anybody listening to this right now who has lived the immigrant life know exactly what I'm talking about. You know, you go to a country, you speak no English, can't get any government assistance. Yeah. And, you know, you and I are both entrepreneurs, so I guess I'll, I'll start on the topic. I've always had a very interesting facet with money because, you know, growing up, we lived in a studio apartment. Mm -hmm. You know, just my parents, my older brother, myself. Rent was three ninety. One of the first observations I, met about, I, I made about life was uh, my parents went to work every day. The landlord came once a month. And the reason why he came once a month was to pick up a check. So observation I made, at 2, 2 a.m., I, I couldn't sleep much as a kid. I was six years old. I remember looking out, and uh, I saw, we lived next to what's known as a gentleman's entertainment center. I got you. Put it nicely. I got you. And I remember, so, so an arcade, an arcade, arcade place. Absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. It's not a place you and I would hang out. You know, gotcha. we're both faith-driven married men, you know, but <laughs> other men, hey, you know, more, go, yeah. more power to you. Yeah, that's, right? that's the thing. But I remember watching at 1 or 2 a.m., I'm six years old, I'm looking at these guys. They're wearing $3,000 custom suits. They're stumbling out. They're getting into their Mercedes and their BMWs and their Lexuses. And I look over, my parents are sharing a twin-size bed that's also doubling as our dining room and our wow, kitchen. wow. You know, and they love the Lord, they love God, they follow biblical principles, mm -hmm. you know, and they care for people. Yeah. And the immediate question I ask is, why? You know, my, the, and the, and the observation... Why, why, why are you in a, in a, why? In yeah, a that's, small apartment? Exactly. Okay. That's literally just, you know what I mean, like the, the one word that came to my mind, like, why? At six years old. At six years old. It's pretty insightful for a six-year-old. Yeah, but it's just an observation. You yeah. know, it's just like, I, my parents are super nice people. These guys, chances are, you know, maybe they're nice, maybe they're not. Yeah. I don't know. You know, but that's just an observation I made. It's like in order for you to love God and follow God, you have to hate money. That you yeah. have to be broke. You have to be poor. Yeah. And I got a lot wiser. I realized that the most uh, God-loving thing that you could do a lot of times is to start a business, is to be a creator, is to create opportunities, to be an entrepreneur. You know, the, I, we were joking off the camera, but the yeah. first content creator was God. You know, to be entrepreneur is to, a lot of times yeah. to be Christ-like. Amen. You know what yeah. I mean? By the way, for those of you watching this, 
What's the earliest age you remember mm. something at? I'm just curious. Put it in the comment wow. section below. Good question. What's the earliest age you remember something at? Was it a profound moment? Mm. Was it something that, uh, uh, similar to Daniel, you recognize what your family situation was like? Put that in the comment section below. I'll read that here in the, as the uh, next video falls after this episode airs. But um, So I'm, I'm thinking here, you, uh, a pastor's kid, yeah. you and your brother. Yeah. What was your wiring when it came to money? Finances. Wow. Because it, it, you know, we're, you're in a small apartment, 399, next to a gentleman's entertainment center. What was your thoughts? My thoughts. So, what, you know, we, when you grow up poor, a lot of times what you learn is poor. You know, that's one of the biggest aspects of generational wealth, and that's why we are in, you know, the situation we're in, in, in this country. Mm -hmm. You know, is that money is just never talked about in the family, around the family dinner table. And that's what drove me. And one of the biggest observations I made was that why is it that every time I meet a missionary, a pastor, somebody that wants to do the good works of the saints, right? Yeah. Paul says in Ephesians, right, the goal of the church, the overall church, is to equip the saints to do the good works of the Holy Spirit. Why is it that those people who are pursuing the good works of the Holy Spirit, they're always asking for one thing. What is it? Donations. Mm. They're always asking for money. Yeah. You know, anytime I met a good missionary, good pastor who had a genuine heart for wanting to change some of the world's biggest problems, the one thing they always lacked was money. So for me, I thought that was just normal. You yeah. know, it's like, oh, to be a businessman, that's evil. You know, it's like, oh, it, 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 that's what I thought at least. Yeah. You know, so that was a big observation I made initially. And that's ultimately what I grew up with. And that led, you know, when you learn poor, that led to me being 18 years old. I had negative $187.65 in my bank account. I had a couple of maxed out credit cards. I actually ended up at one point. Uh, I knew that Dunkin' Donuts closed at 8 p.m. I knew that the manager took out all the unsold bagels and donuts at 8.16. I'd wait in the car at 8.14, and then boom. Intercept. Intercept, <laughs> yeah. And I, I would literally just go through the dumpster and just, all right, just pick up the bag, and that, you know, wow. that's what we do, man. Wow. Yeah. So so you're, you're, you're literally in your, your formative years, in your teenage yeah. years, your wine with money was, was difficult. Now, did... did uh, uh, you and your brother, did you guys say, okay, uh, based on what our parents are are living, based yeah. on what we see he now here in America, right? Yeah. Was there was there the difference between what you guys wanted and desired, the natural ambitions of a teenager, uh, young boys, young men at that yeah. point? Was it different than what you were brought up to be? And, and what was your possible bridges to get what you wanted? Yeah, 100%. My dad wanted me to be a pastor. And then I realized we're all pastors. Let's think of, By the way, you said that to me earlier. For sure, you're define that for you're me. You're Pastor Matt. Think about let's, <laughs> yeah. let's, let's, think, let's think about what a pastor is. Okay, please. Right. So, do. so I'll ask you what in your definition, what is a pastor? Pastor, you know, knows the theology and the Bible in and out, and and is able okay. to you know reference scripture here and there okay. at a whim. And so let's is able to so let's let's think, so let's think about so you have a personal relationship with God. Yes. Right. I yes. do as well. I mean, I talk to him every day. Mm -hmm. You talk to him every sure. day. Sure. Right. What is theology? Theology is the study of God. What is the best way to study God and learn God? Talking to Him. We've got a relationship. So, mm -hmm. do you have a strong base of theology? I guess I do. Absolutely, Pastor Matt. So I don't need a yeah. DVM for that. Why? Okay. You know what I mean, did you? I, I had a, I had an interesting thing. You know, and my dad said I met thousands of pastors. I'm just right? overcoming a limiting and belief right now. I absolutely. Can't believe this happened right before me. <laughs> sure, man. Right? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. You know, you know what's funny is that yeah. you know how could we think? So I always tell people, man, how do you? How can you dream so small when we serve a God that's so big? I always say if your dreams or your goals aren't big enough, it, it, it means you are not aware how much God loves you. Because if only the people, right, like whether it's people in your agency, whether it's entrepreneurs that you call, if only they knew, my friend, how yeah. God sees them and the heart that God has for them. If only they knew. That's profound, bro. You know what I mean? But, 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 yeah, but Daniel, yeah, my yeah. life's messed up, bro. I, you know, I've, I've crossed lines I shouldn't have crossed. I've, sure. I've said things I shouldn't have said. I yeah. think things I shouldn't be thinking. Yeah. I don't want to have that label of pastor Absolutely. across my brain because I yeah. feel like I'm not going to uphold the brand, I guess, For sure. of, yeah. of that. I mean, am I wrong in thinking that? So there's two people in the Bible that betray Jesus, right? Yeah. There's two guys. One, his name was Judas, Judas Iscariot, and the other guy was Peter, right? Because so he denied him. He denied him three times, yeah. right? So one ended up hanging himself on a tree. The other was literally the rock. Jesus, Jesus called him the rock. rock. And I'm not talking about, you know, if you smell, right? I'm not talking about that rock, right? But I'm talking about the rock in which I will build my church, right? Okay. So, so one made one, dis one way, one made one, you know, one dude went one way, the yeah. other dude went the other way. Yeah. The, the idea is that you have the decision. You have the power to make the decision. You know, it's whether or not you respond. 
but either way, Jesus, you know, you know what's really funny? You know, I ask a couple of questions. It's like, you know, I wonder what Jesus would have said to Judas had Judas not committed suicide. Interesting. I think about that. Yeah. You know, another thing I think about is like, you know, I wonder what God's reaction would have been like had Adam and Eve just been honest about what they had done. Interesting. You know, so yeah. you're a dad. Yeah. Right. Yeah. If, if your child went to you, you have a son. Sure. They saw them. Instagram, story, Instagram <laughs> stories that I see from yeah. you. Yeah, I mean, you're a great dad, right? <laughs> Thanks, man. Um, One of my joys. If your son went up to you, right, and let's say that it's, you know, let's say you give him a curfew, yep. right? He grows up to be 15, 16 years old. He's yep. got a curfew. Would you rather have your son come home early because he just wants to be obedient to you and that's just what you told him to do or because he actually understands your heart of you actually want to keep him safe? Sure, that one. Absolutely. That one. And God, in many ways, God's the same way. God doesn't care about results. He doesn't care about what we do right or wrong. Yeah. You know, I mean, I was, I was one of the common questions I get, and I think a lot of pastors get too, is like, well, Daniel, how do I know I'm hearing from God? Great question. Right. And I'm sure you get that question yeah. a lot, Pastor yeah. Matt. Right? <laughs> but a lot of people ask, well, well, how do I know I'm hearing from God? And the reality of the situation is that's not what they're actually asking. Okay. What, they're actually, what they're actually telling me is that they're afraid. They're afraid to fail. What they're really afraid is that, that they're going to hear from God, they're going to act on it, and they're going to be wrong. The reality of the situation, God doesn't see right or wrong. He sees a journey. He sees that, you know, as, as, as a father for him, he wants us to fail and grow and fail and grow. There's nothing better, I'm sure, for you as a dad to see your sons overcome challenges. You'd much rather yeah, have yeah. that than grow up with everything they need, mm -hmm. right? All the cars, money, mm -hmm. you know, that there's no problems that they have. You must, I'm sure, right, because you're, you're very well off, right? I'm, I'm positive that you want your sons to grow up with a killer mentality, to, to have grit, to work hard, <laughs> to know what it means to overcome, overcome challenges and problems. That's what God wants for us at the end of the day. You know, he wants okay. us to get stronger. He wants us to increase. Okay. And at the end of the day, he's got the heart of a father. That's what people don't understand. He's not some guy who just wants you to get things right or wrong. Yeah. I think most Christians, especially pastors, need to recognize it's okay to fail. Because at the end of the day, that's what God wants for us. He wants yeah. us to fail and grow. Yeah. You know, Judas failed, but he didn't grow. Got it. Peter failed, but he grew. He made the decision. Now, are there certain failures that are, are above the normal failures, I guess? Like, for yeah. example, like, you, see, you see these scandals in church. Yeah. You know, these, you know, these heinous things that certain pastors are doing. That, I, I guess that's why, yeah. that's why there's so much pressure on pastors. You know, may, maybe that's in, in a way... Uh, what I'm getting at, there's so much pressure on that title, pastor, that you have to hold yourself so much above approach. But I, I think there's a way, there's, there's like, for example, in the Marines, there's ways for sergeants mm -hmm. to be leading vocally. Yeah. And also, and, and, and are the, the, the squad leaders or the platoon sergeants. But there's also guys with inside the ranks mm. that are also leaders too as well, but they may not have that title, so to speak. They have the same rank, but mm -hmm. not necessarily the same expectation. I don't know if I'm thinking about this uh, any no, differently, but, but you're uh, absolutely right. So a lot of a lot of people feel do feel that pressure, right? So you know, Jesus loves stories. I love the story of the prodigal son. So you know, sure. long story short, younger yeah. son divorces the family, wants his inheritance, goes off to a foreign land, squanders all his money, yeah. and then comes back, and the father runs to him. You know what's an interesting part of that story that no one thinks about? I was actually driving this one time. I got a buddy of mine, former business partner, grew up in a country called Chad, Africa. Uh, it's yeah. one of the most poverty-stricken yeah, countries. Yeah. But you know what's very funny is that the, the way they grew up over there, even now, they're culturally they're very similar to how Jerusalem and Israel was back when Jesus walked. Wow. A lot of the customs are very much the same way. Are there Jews in, uh, in Chad? Uh, I'm not sure. But yeah. I, I, a buddy of mine was a missionary. Oh, so so their family grew up as missionaries in Chad. Yeah. And he says, you know what's crazy about that story that no one talks about is that the father running to the son was arguably the most shameful thing that he could have done. Because the father running to the son. To the son was the most shame. Because in those days, especially a man of that great yeah, my son know, comes to me. status, yeah. the son comes to you. Yeah. Right? They have the beer, right? And yeah. Typically, the, the, what's custom is they sit under the tree and they have people come to them. By having this father run to the son, he actually made himself a public skeptical. Spectacle, sorry. Yeah, yeah, it, was, it, was, yeah. it was actually a, a, humili a, a yeah. very much of a humiliating act. But humiliate himself to do that. Humiliate himself to do that. So the message that Jesus talks about there is that, that God in many ways is, is willing to make himself look like a fool to pursue you who just created wow. the greatest sin. Wow. So I tell people all the time, man, it's just like you, you will never, never, like God will always be a better savior than you are a sinner. Mm. 
doesn't matter, man. Like he will always be a better savior than you are a sinner. Gotcha. So, hey, man, I guess we, uh, that's one thing I got to step myself into then, mm -hmm. if, if that's the case. Yeah. But imagine, but to your point, like yeah. imagine if we had a world where people actually lived into that on and a it, practical day to day basis. Yeah. You don't have to be so damn perfect. Absolutely. You know? Because think about what perfection and think about what pressure prevents. It prevents intimacy. If your son has pressure to perform and be perfect in your eyes as a father, it destroys mm -hmm. honesty and destroys intimacy. My definition and, and authenticity and, and being authenticity. genuine. Yeah. yeah. My definition of intimacy, intimacy is to be made known. Right? When we have this pressure to perform, we are preventing ourselves to be made known to the father. That's it. Right. You know, the father the father makes himself known to us. But at the end of the day, what he wants is intimacy between between us and him. That's what we want. Yeah. You know, like I remember there was one time I was at uh I was at a group and we you know, there we, I don't, I'm not a big advocate of the traditional Bible study, you know, because at the end of the day, I believe that the father wants nothing more than to see his kids be in fellowship, be in love and serve. So, you know, we have this group where every Wednesday night we get together, you know, a bunch of buddies and I it was actually uh, founded by my good friend, Andy Willemies, and it's called the Young Professional Forum. We, we get together and we cool. just talk about what does it mean to be authentic? What does it mean to follow Jesus? What does yeah. it mean to authentically have, you know, to love one another? Yeah. And we just get together. And I remember in the middle of our conversation, the Holy Spirit spoke to me. God spoke to me. And it was just like a knife went in through my heart. And this is what he told me. He said, Daniel, I love that you donate to all these different charities and nonprofits. I love that, you know, you're very ambitious and you're living into how I, you know, created you and how I wired you. I love that you're doing all these things and creating opportunities for other individuals through jobs. And I love that you're a loving guy and you're, you're, you're doing all these great things. I just wish sometimes we could do it together. <laughs> and that, and that killed, that, dude, that, wow. that was like a knife. You said heart. something at lunch. We had. It's, it's yeah. one thing to do big things. Do the three things you talked about. Can you can you share that on three things? That, that I'm me, doing yeah. because of God. Yes. Because God. Yes. Yeah. So so that that, that kind of laid into that, yeah. right? So when I was younger, I, I wanted to do things a lot of things for God. It's like oh no, I want to build hospitals. I want to build yeah. schools. I want to do and th and that's and that's almost the model of my generation. Our generation is really the first generation to have social media and see all the evils that's going on around the world. You know, everything from, you know, you could say police brutality to bombings and everything. Yeah. So we want to do a lot of things for God. And when I was in college, I got a little wiser and I realized that I, I should do things because of God. Because I should be, I should be reacting to his grace. I should be reacting to, mm -hmm. to all the love that he asked for me. And I should respond and actually live into that. And then, you know, one day in, in very much the same fashion, God spoke to me and says, I don't want any of that. I just want you to do things with me. <laughs> That's it, man. And that's so free. So freeing. for God, because of God, and now with God. with God. And ultimately, that's what God wanted, you know. And, you know, it's just like the same analogy, you know. It's like, wow. you know, as, as a father for you, um, I'm sure there's nothing more than you would like for your son to just do things, want to do things with you, yeah. to want to hang out with you. Yeah. And at this point, I'm sure you don't care if, whether or not he does it right, whether he does it wrong. Yeah. You're just happy that you guys are, are hanging out, man. Yeah. You guys are creating interesting. memories and bonds, yeah. and things that will last forever. By the way, that was a profound moment right there. By the way, if you thought that was a profound moment, drop it in the comment section below. For God, because of God, yeah. and now with God. I'd love to know what your thoughts are on that. Jot that in the comment section below. Let me ask you this question. Yes, um, coming from Korea, because I know when, when, when I was in the military, I was stationed there in Osan. And yes. We did, uh, we did uh, uh, Cobra Gold, which is a joint, for, uh, joint exercise to mimic as if the North Korean were reinvading uh, South Korea. Did, did any any memories there growing up of relatives, any North Korean relatives, mm. and any any connections there back to Korea with you? Yeah, no, so not not me personally. I'm sure mm. my grandma will have you know, a lot lot more stories, but but the, you know that parallel there. There's yeah. com, you know there's communism yes. on one side, yeah, and 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 the uh, capitalism and democracy yeah. uh, south of that parallel. And one of my favorite pictures to depict mm. whether or not capitalism works. Yeah. is a night shot from space Yes, of the difference between no North Korea at night, darkness, nothing Yeah, uh, uh, on the nor north of that parallel. But south of it, night shot from space, light and yes. life. This kind of tells you where... Yeah, where yeah it it's is. Like the, I think it's like the number 12 economy in the world. It's the power of capitalism. <laughs> yeah. And by the way, know? my wife, uh, Sheena, she loves right. everything Korean. <laughs> That's right. Korean food. Yes. Korean dramas. Mm -hmm. Korean K-pop. Okay. <laughs> Everything's Korean. Yeah. So, so what are your thoughts about you know where capitalism is in America today, yeah. 
Because you're a capitalist. I mean, you're Absolutely. taking capital. 100%. And, but they're talking about this whole socialistic programs that's going on in America today and, and, and how should we as believers mm -hmm. perceive what's going on in our country th yes. through that lens. So one of, one of the big epiphanies and one of the things I've learned recently is how do we play in God's economy and okay. not man's economy? Correct. You know, how do we operate our business as if it is on earth, you know, on earth as it is in, in heaven. heaven? Yeah, nice. You know, so, you know, I'm, if anyone that watches my videos will know I'm a, I'm a very anti-socialism individual. I, I'm a big advocate of capitalism, you know, a big advocate. And the, one of the reasons why I, I'm so against socialism because, you know, at the end of the day, it, it promotes laziness. It does, whether people like it or not. You know, I saw a quote where it says the problem with socialism is that eventually you run out of other people's money. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You know? Which is, there's some truth to that, yeah, you know. Yeah. Now, I, I, I understand why people in my generation push socialism so much. Because, yeah. you know, as, I don't know if you've been noticing, but millennials, Gen Z, the younger we get, it just seems that the the popularity of socialism, especially it's, it's democratic more, socialism, yeah, is yeah. getting more and more and yeah. more and more. So the reason why I don't like socialism is because, for me, I'm, I'm always around, what is the spirit telling me? Because I've learned through many hard and difficult paths and, and really through surrender that my job at the end of the day is to align with God's heart, is to walk with the Spirit every single day, to see you, Matt Zappala, as the way God sees you. And not only that, but to have God's heart for Matt Zappala, you know. And nice. to, to everybody, even you you're telling me about your buddy Patrick, right, how mm -hmm. he's, he loves asking questions. He's a, he's a truth seeker. Yeah. You know, if he was here right in front of us, I'd tell him, dude, keep seeking the truth because I believe that all truth leads to Jesus Christ. You know, and, and and you will have more intimacy with the Father than going to church on Sunday morning. Yeah. yeah. In doing so, yeah. I would actually applaud him and and give him a high five. You know, I mean, he's six five, so I have to. You know, what I mean, I have to like, it's yeah, like, that BBD, right? <laughs> yeah, I had to go all the way up. You know, but but it, you know, if, if you look at Scripture, it how often does Jesus end the parable with you know, and it says, and the Master says, "You lazy, ungrateful servant, you will be thrown out where there is darkness and gnashing of teeth." Yeah. It's Matthew 25 right there. Matthew 25, yeah. right? There's there's three or four different parables where Jesus yeah. talks about that. Yeah. But understandably so, right, our generation and Gen Z, the reason why they love socialism so much is because of exactly kind of what we allude to. They see so much pain in this world. And then they sure. see these millionaires and billionaires, right? Or yeah. Bernie would say, yeah. millionaires, <laughs> billionaires, right? Driving around in yachts and all this stuff. And they're like, well, why don't these people just help? And, you know, we should yeah. tax them. And that's going to solve everything, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. Well, that's not necessarily true, yeah. right? The biggest problem that I would actually say that is occurring in America right now is division. Huge. Division. Yep. You know, Is that the United States yes. of America? That's what making America great. The United yeah. States. Everybody's together. Yeah. And I would say a lot of the problems won't be solved by the unity of, you know, black or white, uh, male and female, right, uh, Democrat or, or conservative. I would actually say that a vast majority, if not all problems, would be solved if simply business leaders and politicians started working together. If they started working together, I'm convinced that a vast majority of problems in the United States would be solved. Because a lot of times individuals who work in, you know, the public sector or work in politics, and I'm not talking down, mm -hmm. but a lot of times they don't possess the problem-solving abilities that entrepreneurs have. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times entrepreneurs see policymakers as, oh, people that are just in the way. Yeah. You know, people who don't know what they're doing. People who are, So I'm convinced that there was some unity there. I think that'd be a fantastic, fantastic change. Oftentimes people watch this video and see where you're at, see where your YouTube yeah. channel is at, and read your book. And people say, well, it's so, so easy for you, Daniel. It's easy for you to say that because, you know, you're well off. You got things going for you. Could you please uh, cut through the noise and yeah. tell everybody the real deal? What did you start with? How did you get your real estate investing career? Yeah. And you now your equity fund. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Rolling. So, I mean, I grew up very poor. I, like I said, an immigrant, right? I mean, I, I remember getting made fun of because I wear the same clothes to mm -hmm. school. And, you know, I remember there was we, our parents, my family, we'd sleep in the car multiple nights, couldn't afford to pay a heating bill, wow. right? You know, the, February. The car was hot, yeah, yeah. yeah, 100%. Yeah. You know, I remember there was one time, you know, we all went to the park. And my mom, I saw her picking weeds and flowers, and she was putting them in the plastic containers. I'm like, oh, that's cute. He must be giving it to my dad. You know, I wonder if it's their anniversary. You know, it's, it's great. And then, and then two hours later, I saw that on our dinner plate. And that's all we had, you know. So, again, fast forward 18, negative $187.65 in my bank account, maxed out credit cards. And that right there, that's how God got my attention. Because Jesus says, all right, Daniel, you know the Bible super well. And I do. I read the Bible at this point probably eight to ten times over. Sure. You know, my dad's got a doctorate in biblical studies, right? I mean, very well-educated man. Mm -hmm. And God says, it's, it's time for you to stop believing in me, and it's actually time for you to start following me. All right? It, it's, it's a mindset shift. Are you ready to actually start following me now? And I said, oh, yeah. okay, great. So 
I loved real estate. I always had a knack for real estate. I'm a diehard Chicago Bulls fan. Yeah. Right. Do we have time? Do we have time for a quick 30 second story? Of okay. So, so I remember being the Bulls anytime. Five years old. Want to throw in a Bears story too? As well. yeah, that, <laughs> yeah. Hey. Right. I'm a big Bears fan too. But I remember being five years old. I was in Korea and I loved basketball. I absolutely loved basketball. I had an older cousin that played for his high school team. Uh, he was really good, so we'd always go watch him play. And I remember when my mom said we were going to move to America, I was bummed because I thought no more basketball. So during the 14 hour flight, I'm like, oh, I'm crying because like my friends are gone, you know, and, and no more basketball. I get off O'Hare. It's late 90s. Do you remember those box TVs they had in O'Hare Airport in, in the corners? Sure. Those big yeah, box yeah, TVs, yeah. right? Yeah. So I walk out of the gate, and my earliest memory of being in O'Hare Airport, I look up, and there's a guy. And uh, I was like, oh, that guy's skin's a little darker than most Korean players. Okay. Well, he's a little taller than most Korean players. And then he did this, this thing where he jumped away from the basket and shot it. And I was like, oh, that's a little different. That's an interesting move. And then I saw the number. And he was wearing number 23. I was like, who is that guy? I really like that guy. I think that's going to be my favorite player. And this guy played for the Chicago Bulls. And so obviously we both know that's MJ. That's the GOAT. Yeah. You know, yeah. that's MJ. So every time my mom, my mom and I, we didn't have a TV, right? Because, you know, every time we walked by one of those video stores, remember back then they had those sure. stores with all the TVs, yeah. right? And people would gather yeah. around and watch. Uh, I remember every time my mom and I would walk past, we, we'd see this guy named number 23. I'm like, Mom, look, there, there he is. That's my favorite player. And so I, I was always a diehard Chicago Bulls fan growing up. You know, I mean, ever since as long as I can remember, I was watching the Bulls because mm-hmm. uh, it helped me cope with this new country, you know. And so uh, I researched when I was 17 years old because, again, I wanted to at that point, I wanted to do a lot of things for God. I researched uh, what was the number way, one way of people making money. And it was real estate. Right. That's how the top one percent made the vast majority of their money. And I looked up who owned the Chicago Bulls, this guy named Jerry oh, Reinsdorf. Yeah. And I saw that I read his biography. I was like, this guy made his money in real estate. So I, for, you know, I always had in the back of my mind, real estate, real estate, real estate. And so uh, I prayed, you know, when I saw that negative number in my bank account, went to that financial predicament, you know, I, I surrendered it all. I said, all right, God, I'm going to start following you. Six months later, I met a guy who was willing to take me under his wing and I would work for free. You know, part of the reason why people aren't successful is they're too cool. Right? They're too cool. They're like, oh, I don't want to be in that. You know, I don't want to go to that meeting or yeah. I don't want to, you know, yeah. they're too cool for school, yeah. you know. And so uh, I, I work for free. You know, I, I paid wow. thousands of dollars at the time. My brother and I actually called our credit card company to beg them to increase the line so we could pay for education to learn how to do this thing. Yeah. So, you know, long before that, I started, you know, following and following and, and I started reading and I'd get up you know, I, I would get up at six, seven in the morning, wouldn't go to sleep till one or two at night. The entire time I would learn about real estate. I would learn about investing, yeah. macroeconomics, hundred percent. You know, why, what is, what is inflation? What is, what is yeah. quantitative easing? What's policy, you know, monetary policy, fiscal policy. Yeah. And I remember being 22 years old and I, I remember being, uh, if not the smartest, one of the smartest guys in every single room I walked in when it came to real estate and investing. But I made zero money. And but I you got knew everything though. But I knew everything though. Okay. And I became very frustrated. And whenever I'm frustrated, I go to I go to, you know, God. You know, because that's just who I go to when I, whenever I'm happy, mad, say, right? I think we should treat our heavenly father like our actual father, right? Or the father that we never had, unfortunately. You know, mm-hmm. I have to say that mm-hmm. now in America. Yeah. Um, and so I, 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 I got very frustrated. And then God took me to John chapter 13. And John chapter 13 is one of my most favorite chapters in the Bible because it shows you who Jesus really was. So word for word, it's a story how Jesus and his disciples are in the Passover feast. They're walking into this room. And scripture actually says at this moment, Jesus had realized that the father had put everything under his authority and that he was from the father and he was returning to the father. Meaning that Jesus realizes that he's the most powerful being in the universe. Right? He's stronger than Superman, Batman, Iron Man, Thanos, <laughs> you name it. Right? Um, and what he does next, and scripture says, so, as so, cause and effect, he begins to remove his outer clothing, brings out a basin of water, and he begins to wash the feet of his disciples. Right? Which, by the way, people don't understand. Washing the feet at that time was the, the, the lowest ranking slave, not even servant, slave. That was the job for the lowest ranking slave to do. And for him, it was very awkward for him to do that. Right? They're like, Rabbi, you don't do that. And so what the Spirit spoke to me then was, Daniel, your problem is that you have a very good mind, but whenever you walk out of a room, the people's feet are still dirty. Mm. Everybody around you still has dirty feet. That's the problem. And so whenever I get a lesson from God, I ask the Holy Spirit on how I can apply it. Because at the end of the day, like people are like, Daniel, how do I get closer to God? I ask him. You know, the person that knows best on how to get closer to God is God. Right? Uh, that's why he sacrifices. Right? And by the way, I believe that the truest form of love is sacrifice. 
if you love your business, if you love your clients, sure. you're going to make the sacrifices. Sure. Like we said right. in, in Marines too, I said, you love your country, you love your brother, you give your life for him. Take a bullet Absolutely. for your country, take a bullet for yeah. your brother, of course. 100%. Yeah. So, family, yeah. so I asked the Holy Spirit, it's like, well, what, how do I apply that on a day-to-day -day basis? So it became very simple. I, I got a, a notepad. And uh, at the time, I belonged to a real estate investing network. And we had about five, 600 people that would meet in one location. And so I remember going to almost every single one of them, and I asked them one simple question. I said, hey, what are some of the greatest obstacles you have in your business? And I got all sorts of answers. And the majority of people said, well, you know, I need capital to do my deals. I'm finding great deals, but I need capital. And strangely enough, mm -hmm. you know, I would go to some people and they say, well, Daniel, I'm an orthopedic surgeon. I make half a million dollars a year. I got $1.2 million sitting in my account. And my CPA is telling me I need to get that money into some real estate deals. Okay. So I'm like, well, that's easy. Right. Just connect, connect the two. Them, yeah. But I, I offered my value. I, I was because I was interested in actually washing people's feet and serving without expecting anything in return. You know, there's, in, in, in this world, there's givers and there's takers. You know, for me, I'll, I always be I'll always be a giver. I love being a giver. I think that's it represents who I am as a man in Christ, as a man of God. So for, for me, you know, um, I started connecting. But I also told my the investors on one side, it's like, hey, I know a lot about real estate. Why don't I do you a favor and I'll vet the deals for you? Okay. You know, and I'll, I'll, you know, I'll see if it's a good deal, see if it's a bad deal, and I'll kind of just be your eyes and ears. And they're like, oh, thank you. And so it wasn't long before I started connecting them, and one guy called me. He's like, hey, man, I really appreciate you bringing the capital to this deal. Mm -hmm. Do you want 20%? Nice. And I'm like, oh, yeah, sure, absolutely. And I learned a very valuable lesson in that moment. I learned the lesson that God cares more about the business and the vision than I do. Right? Like, I think if you're a parent watching this right now, if you're a dad, if you're a mom, I think we need to have the realization that God loves your kids more than you do. <laughs> that God wants to see your kids succeed in life more than you do, more than you could possibly ever imagine. You know, and if you think about that, oh man, that's, that's, that's big. And, and you know, because for us as entrepreneurs, we have a lot of times the same desire. We want to change the world based on how we desire it to be. We want to see, for you, you want to see a world where people are more aware of the, the power of, the, of insurance. And we talk about all the time, the power of whole life cash value insurance, how that, in my opinion, should take over the 401k industry. You know, yeah. I, I see a yeah. vision where the American family ha can have comfortable conversations about finances around the dinner table. Because I didn't have that. You didn't mm -hmm. have that. People mm -hmm. in this room didn't have that. Right. You know, so for, for me, it's just like, well, that's the vision. God cares more about the business than I do. So let me. So I started connecting people. A guy offered me 20 percent and I started learning as a partner. And I started actually being in the closing tables and figuring out documents and, you know, going to visit sellers and learning how to negotiate. You started shadowing. And I started shadowing because I had some stake in the game. Sure. You know? And so um, it wasn't long before I started. I went off on my own. And by the time I was 23, in 2017, um, you know, my goal in January 1 was to have, I wanted 20 units. That's what I wanted. The Holy Spirit spoke to me and says, Daniel, don't set goals, set standards and expectations. Because if you set standards and expectations your goals will be a byproduct of what you set yeah. for yourself. Right? Great. So I set standards and expectations. I said, these are the three things I'm going to do every single week. These are three things I'm going to do every single day. You know, like uh, Abraham Lincoln once said, right? You know, if you give me six hours to chop down a tree, I'll spend four sharpening the ax. So that's what I started watching doing. YouTube videos, how? Exactly, <laughs> right. You know, and so I set standards and expectations for myself. My goal in January 1st, 2017 was 20. At, by the December 31st of 2017, I had 83. Wow. So I went from... It's in a year. In a year. So I went from almost zero to $8 million worth of real estate in one year. Just just, just doing that. By washing people's feet. That's what I did. Yeah. So when, when you're looking at... Uh, mass, uh, yeah, thank respect, you, sir. Respect. Appreciate it. So when, you, when, yeah. you, when you're looking at that type of situation, um, you know, for people today, uh, in 2021 at the recording of this video, yeah. what do you think are some universal principles that you can say, okay, here's a good deal, Here's a bad deal. Or is it just like, if you can give like a quick checklist, yes. because everybody tends to be very emotional when it comes yeah. to deals because they want it to work. Yeah. Right. But what, what, what do you sniff out mm. is a good deal and a bad deal and having that spiritual discernment about it, not getting too emotionally connected to it for you to say yay or nay. Yeah. So I, I'm probably, money is very low on my list of motivators. Like if you want to motivate me, like money should be the last thing you should talk about. Right. But in terms of, you know, because I get that question a lot. It's like, well, Daniel, you know, w w w how do you find good deals? Well, w w define good. You know, okay. good for who? Good for me? Good for you? Right. Like it depends. So for a lot of people watching this, the, the first step I would advise and encourage people to take is, well, for one, look at your finances. You know, if you're doing a real estate deal, 
what are the things that you need? Mm -hmm. I know doctors today who will gladly take negative cash flow on a property because for them, they want the write-offs. They want the depreciation and they want the equity. They're already making enough money as it is, right? Yeah. You know, some, some of these doctors are making $750,000, you know, per year. Yeah. So for them, they don't need the extra cash flow. They love their job. Yeah. They wouldn't change anything about their life, yeah. but they do want to set something up long-term and something tangible. Mm -hmm. So for them, they, they, they'll they buy properties. They'll buy, I, I've literally seen doctors who will buy properties on five-year amortizations, you know, because they want the equity and they want, they want the tax benefits, yeah. you know? But at the same time, I've met other investors who, you know, like, like a lot like myself, three, four years ago, when I was in a position where I needed the money a little bit more, where I would I would buy the real estate for the sake of cash flow, okay. right? So I would put things on. Would that be your first layer of encouragement if someone's going to go about that for direction? For sure, yes. Have some, yeah. for I sure. love it because you know, we're yeah. always talking about in Seven Fear Squad how to become a first generation cash flow yes. millionaire. Not just being a millionaire on paper because you yeah. want that thing coming in because you have the most control when you got the cash flow coming in yeah so, so and it's, cash, cash it, it, it's interesting too i mean it's just like insurance right like yeah. well what what type of policy should i get well yeah. it depends <laughs> you know what are your yeah. goals what are you looking to do where are you at right now yeah. right if you're talking about paid up additions premiums death mm -hmm. benefits right mm -hmm. if you're talking about all these different lingos and certain policies um it, it completely depends yeah. you know it, it absolutely does depend on on each each particular individual got it yeah got it so what are some financial fundamentals you would say okay if you wanted to launch your career off Mm -hmm. into the world of real estate investing. Mm. And we're, we're, we're being very clear about it because I got a video on my YouTube channel called 10 Reasons Why I Chose Real Estate. 10 Reasons Why I Chose Insurance Versus Real Estate mm. from a realtor standpoint yeah. versus an insurance agent standpoint. I see, yeah, yeah, yeah. But this is a different story. This is about being yeah. a real estate investor. Yes. So what are some basic financial equipment one should have in saying, okay, if this is yeah. something I want to go down, let me get down a real estate investing route. Mm. Here's some basic financial fundamentals. What are they yeah. in today's, today's and, and by the way, I'm a real estate guy. Mm -hmm. Like I consider myself mm -hmm. to be a real estate expert. If I had to choose between being an insurance agent and a real estate agent, I would choose insurance. How come? Because I'm convinced you actually learn more about personal finances, generational wealth. You learn more about how the market works yeah. if you are in the insurance industry. Because people don't understand how much insurance affects our markets, <laughs> how much insurance affects our, you know, investment, capital markets, labor markets, you name it. Yeah. And again, not a knock against realtors, right? I have realtor friends that make $50,000 a year. They drive great cars. They have great careers. And, I, you know, they do a great service. Mm -hmm. uh, but for me, if you're a real estate agent, um, you take a course, you, you get licensing, you, you learn all the laws within just that industry. You don't really go beyond. And at the end of the day, your number one skills is sales, you know? You don't really go outside right. the housing market. Uh, but yeah. when you're an insurance agent, you learn so much more than just about the insurance industry because the insurance industry is so tied to so many different things. Yeah. So between me and you, like I, that's actually my personal preference. I would actually choose. I would actually agree with you on that one. You know, that I would I would totally be an insurance agent over a real estate agent. An interesting thing there, too, is uh, there's also that, that uh, cousin uh, peanut butter and, re and jelly relationship with between real yes. estate. Yes, yeah. And I mean, right here in Chicago, yeah. uh, the biggest... Uh, namesake buildings, largest, high, yeah. you know, biggest building, namesake buildings in downtown Chicago are owned by yes. insurance companies. Yeah. I mean, you look at Willis Tower. I, I ask people all the time, what's Willis? What's the <laughs> biggest? No, what what does Willis do? Yeah. I don't know. Guess what they do? Yeah. They do insurance. You know, you pass up Trump Tower, you go down, and you see another building there in uh, Gold Coast. That's John Hancock. Yep. What does John Hancock do? I don't know. It's insurance. insurance. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, MetLife, you name it. Right. Uh, uh, yeah. A Prudential building downtown, sure. insurance. You yeah. know, uh, Aon building, uh, Mil Millennium Park, mm -hmm. insurance. Um, Bread building downtown, CNA, insurance. Yeah. I mean, the largest buildings in most iconic buildings, even in downtown Chicago, are yeah. insurance. And you go to New York. Same thing. Same thing. Yeah. San Francisco, same thing. So a lot of people don't understand. Like, so there's a, you know, insurance loves real estate, real estate loves insurance. Insurance. And it, you know, it just it happens that way because a lot of times we made it. We just made a video about this on Monday. How both of these are, they stand the test of time. Yeah, you know, because yeah. they they're hedged against inflation. Yeah, you know, they increase, they decrease. It's one of the those two things are the most powerful financial instruments I believe in America. But yet for some reason, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. our schools don't teach that. Of course not. Right. Yeah. We teach we teach accumulation as opposed to cash flow. It would the schools you know? teach us go to college, get student uh, loan debt, and hopefully get a job when you get out. But you're saddled with. For sure. That in Proverbs says, yeah. you know, the borrower is ensla enslaved to the lender. Yes. You know, and so we're setting up our kids for that. Yeah. And by the way, I've got three older kids. Mm. I'll tell them, listen, your dad made his millions without a college degree. And if you want to go to college, no problem. Yeah. That's how we'll pay for it. I'll pay for some of it. You got to pay for some of it too because I don't believe any. 
Yeah. Free education. But by, by the way, if you're if you're watching and you're an 18 year old kid or a 19 year old kid or you're young, and you know, because I get that question a lot, I was yeah. like, Daniel, should I go? Because I'm a dropout. I dro- I've dropped out my senior year of college. Nope. Okay. Yeah. And and so people ask me, should I go to college? I I tell them, here's what I would do. If you're looking to be in business, f- find somebody that that is doing what you're doing. Work for free during the nighttime. Audit certain college classes like accounting, yeah. business law, yeah. you know, um, management. Right. Like th- there are certain you know classes in college that are actually I believe are worth it. Right. But you're talking about knowledge and education versus the degree. I take education knowledge any day of the week. If I were to hire somebody today and then, you know, I had two guys, one person, like, hey, I got a college degree from Harvard. Mm-hmm. And the other person says, hey, I worked four years you know, in this you know, industry. And I worked, you know, I, I worked one year in each different office and mm-hmm. I worked for a property management firm. I worked for you know, an investment mm-hmm. firm and I got experience underwriting deals and I managed properties before. Mm-hmm. And by the way, I you know, audited accounting. Hire that kid right yeah. there on the spot. Yeah. On the spot. Yeah, right. Before anybody else takes him. Yeah. You know? So that that to be my message to 18, 19 year old kids for, for a lot of them to ask me like, hey, how do I break into real estate? How can I eventually do what you're doing? Yeah. You know, um, you asked me a question about what are some financial principles for, for somebody starting out in real estate? Sure. Um, and some financial equipment, you know, what, yeah. what type of tangible, um, tangible things should they have? Yes, absolutely. So one of the biggest myths is that you know, people say that, oh, I need money to do real estate. Well, that's not true. I didn't have any. I didn't have any money. I had negative yeah, dollars for right. sure. So what I did is I raised money. And people are always like, oh, I hate raising money. I hate asking people for money. That's not the, the perspective shift for a second, yeah. right? So I'll, I'll ask you a question. Matt, do you think there's more people in the United States that have a minimum of $150,000 that they're able to invest? Or do you think that there's people who actually know what the heck they're doing in the real estate investment game? Uh, the other side. For sure. Yeah. Absolutely. So in my observation, I, I, I choose to travel a lot. I mm-hmm. still do. Right. Pre, even pre COVID, I was on like three, four flights a week traveling to talking about real estate. I, I came across a lot of different people in my estimation for every one person that actually knows what they're doing in real estate, that actually knows how to put together a business plan, build a team, hire a coach, et cetera, mm-hmm. et cetera. There's probably about 50, 50 to a hundred people that have at least $150,000 in their account that they're able to invest. Yeah. So, if I have this opportunity, mm-hmm. it's a solid deal, right? What is more valuable, the opportunity or the money? Opportunity, yeah. It's the opportunity. Absolutely. So, for, you know, a lot, I, have, I have a student, you know, because I offer one-on-one coaching for real estate. I have a student who raised, with that mindset shift, I, I gave her the mindset shift, and I also taught her a couple of techniques that we talk about in my inner circle. And she went out, knew nothing about real estate beforehand. She raised, uh, she raised a million dollars in one week to do deals incredible yeah. you know so for me that's the mindset shift that we got to have so there's three things i call the three legged stools of real estate okay um you got to have you got to have knowledge and guidance so always have somebody in your corner that you could refer to that you could ask always have a second pair of eyes you know always have the best books the best podcasts you know which i, I mean i got a book i wrote a book zero to 75 units in one year it's absolutely free all they got to do is just go to zero to 75 units uh, in one year.com um we got a link here yeah okay. perfect right yeah. It's, again it's absolutely free uh, so knowledge and guidance. Other one is tools and resources. So understand what softwares, what are the best things for you to utilize to be able to. And then last but not least, have the people and the resources. Yeah. So have your team, your capital lined up. If you could master these three things and if you sat down, if, and, and most most problems I feel like would be solved if people simply just sat down and took half hour to just map out what they want. Yeah. If they just literally sat down for 30 minutes and, and organized their thoughts, okay, three things I need here, I need from here, here, here. I'm convinced that people will do just fine. Yeah. As I wrap up, what, what are your your last thoughts? If somebody's watching our channel, they want to think like a millionaire, they want to strategize mm-hmm. like a millionaire, and they want to become a first generation cash flow millionaire. Yeah. And, and and understand the values and principles of making sure that it lasts the test of time. Mm-hmm. Up, down market, you know, craziness in the economy, COVID, pandemic, lockdown, shutdown, anything. How would you what are your two cents and how would you guide them through that in building their wealth, building yeah. their enterprise? with God? Yeah. So that's a very interesting question. I, you know, typically a lot of people at this point would say, well, if you want to make a million dollars, help a million people, you know? And <laughs> I, I believe in that, by the way, sure. I absolutely do. You know what I mean? Yeah. But I don't, I don't think that's a hundred percent truth, right? I mean, I can go to downtown Chicago yeah. and hand out hot dogs all day long and I can help a million people. It doesn't mean I'm going to make a million dollars. You know, the question that I would ask is what is the byproduct? What are the action steps that you're doing right now that is that is creating byproducts that is equaling to a million dollars? So I would say two things. Number one, uh, have what's known as your KPIs, your key performance indicators. 
right? Okay. Set standards and expectations. What are things that you should be doing every single day, every single week, every single month mm. to ensure your success? Most people fail because they have no idea what success even means. They have no ways of tracking and progressing, it right? It's one thing. It's just, just one thing, thing. Yeah. right? It, like it's most, the only thing, yeah. most people feel like, oh, like I'm gonna one day get to a rooftop and say, I made it, right? Like that never happens. That yeah. never happens. <laughs> you know, if you're doing it the right way, that day never comes. Yeah. Cause it's a, it's it's constant battle. It's a constant struggle, you know. You know you know the word love, um, in three different religions. So in Judaistic, uh, it actually means struggle. Love in Judaism it actually means mm-hmm. struggle. In Islam, it love actually means submission. In Christianity, love means sacrifice. So if you're talking about sacrifice, struggle, right, and uh, submission, do you think love? No, not at all. You know, not, like, people think torture. People think torture, <laughs> right? Or some sick, twisted, you know, whatever, yeah, yeah, you know. Yeah. Uh, but anyways, before we go down yeah. that path, key performance indicators, yeah. right? We, we got to have the discipline. My, my recommendation to go to somebody that you love, respect, that is doing what you're doing and ask them, what are some of the key performance indicators? What are some things that you did every single day, every single month, every single week that, that you did to, get to help, help get to where you are right now? And what are some things that you would change? And do that with five, ten different individuals. And and, and and really think about what you're really good at. And so marinate that with what your talents are, what, mm-hmm. what today's market is, what people want. You know, go out, collect data, ask people what are some of the greatest problems that I can help solve for you right now. If you do all those things, you will have so much clarity in terms of what you should do today to help you become a millionaire. Um, it's a lot. It will keep yeah. people busy yeah. for sure. Um, second story, I'm going to wrap up with this last story. So I remember I was sitting down with an investor friend of mine and, uh, we were sitting in Rosemont and this guy is, you know, worth a lot of money. You know I mean? He's the type of dude where he would say, you know, Daniel, you know, any, any deal under 20 million, just let me know, ring me up. I'll write a check in two weeks, you know? And unfortunately, you know, he's, he's passed, Mm. you know, so rest in peace. But, uh, I remember we were sitting at a restaurant together and, you know, he says, Daniel, you ever meet a billionaire? I'm like, no, uh, no. You know, I met. I only met two billionaires in my life, by the way. I met that dude, story about, and I met Mark Cuban. And then, nice, so nice. Uh, I'm, I'm sitting down, and I said, no. And he's like, well, you're about to. My buddy Mark is walking in. So interesting. This guy' name was also Mark. So I, uh, I won't share that. I never got his name, by the way. I only knew his first name. But he was walking by, and uh, I was like, hey, my name is Daniel Kwok. How are you? I was 22 at the time. So this is about five years ago. And he's like, hey, nice to meet you, young man. How are you doing? You know, how's he treating you? Great. We pick- and, I, and I asked myself, I, you know, my friend tells me you're a billionaire. Super humble guy. Watching him, you would have never guessed he's a billionaire, right? You would actually think he was a thousandaire. He's well. a billionaire, right? And so I, I asked him, like, I, I got to ask. I'm tempted here. And, and please, you know, I'm, I hope I'm not sounding rude. But what made you a billionaire compared to a millionaire? What are the things that you did? Good question that separated you from being a millionaire. It's like kind of watching an NBA game, right? It's like, wh- what do these guys do that the college players didn't do? Because yeah. the college players, same same amount of talent, mm-hmm. nine times out of 10, same size, same size. What is it that these NBA guys did differently? So I asked this dude, hey, what did you do that made you a billionaire? And he says, Daniel, millionaires focus on ideas, execution. They focus on strategy. They focus on whatever, vision, whatever you name it. Above all, there's one thing I've always focused on. By the way, subscribe while I have you in this moment. <laughs> it's a, it's a Matt's channel. All right? right. Click, 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 click. Right? But he says, there's one thing I focused on above all things, and it was networking. That's it. He's like, that's the one thing I've always constantly been intentional about my entire career. Ever, he said, massive. as long as I could remember, as long as I was seven years old, whenever I meet somebody very cool, interesting, awesome for me to learn from, I would ask the individual, is there anybody else that, hey, could you, you, would you mind introducing me to somebody that I'm having a big problem with this? Or, hey, I'm, I'm you know, looking to do this. Would, he was never afraid to ask for new networks. He saw people, he saw networks as currency as opposed to, right? I, I believe there's four currencies in life. Right? There's knowledge, people, time, and money. Money, for, you know, for a very specific reason, an obvious reason, is the lowest on our list. Right? right? Time, people, not. People, I, I'm convinced in business is the most important currency, right? People and time. But that's what he says. Is above all, I've prioritized one thing above anything else, and it was networking those people and building bridges and actually learning the art of collaboration. That was it. And that stuck with me, like, even to this day. Powerful. Yeah. And that's why I'm getting emails from Katie here as we've begun this podcast, yeah. this interview, of collaborating together with you and the Quark Brothers. So yeah. that being said, man, 
Thanks for allowing me into your studio. Absolutely. Thanks for allowing me into your life. Mi casa, Thanks. su casa. Yeah, and uh, yes, yeah, right, from two yeah. Asian guys. That's right. <laughs> if, by the way, what are your thoughts? What are your follows? What's your feedback? What's your continued questions as this evolution, uh, this podcast, and this conversation continues to evolve and as you marinate on some of the things that Daniel mentioned? Drop it in the comment section below. And uh, when you look at this studio, guys, do you think this is something we should create for the Seven Figure Squad studio too as well? This is awesome. And screens here. I'm yeah. learning a lot. From I love that picture. You look like John Cena, man. Look at that. It's like, you know. <laughs> We're going to do some big things here today. Yeah. We're going to be some financial heavyweights for helping a lot of other people. Yes. And I hope that we've helped you by watching this too as well. So here in the Seven Fear Squad, we want to help you think like a millionaire, strategize like a millionaire, so therefore you can become a first generation, highly networked, cash flow, millionaire, billionaire. Because we want to rename this YouTube channel one day to <laughs> Eight Figure Squad, Nine Figure Squad, and so on and so forth. So with that being said, guys, if you haven't done so already, make sure you follow Daniel Kwok here and the Kwok Brothers on Instagram, as well as subscribing to the YouTube channel. If you're watching this on Facebook, make sure you click on uh, our business page, Money Smart Guy, click like. If you're watching this on YouTube, make sure you click subscribe and hit notifications to be alerted next time we upload our next episode. That being said, on behalf of Daniel Kwok, yes. I'm your Money Smart Guy, and until we meet again, continue to live smart, continue to love smart, and be money smart today. God bless you, man. Hey. Appreciate you, bro.